Hey viewers, Nick Carver here, and this is a tutorial on how to scan film using your Epson Perfection film scanner. So whether it's a V700, V750, 800-850, whatever you got, we're looking at how to scan film on it. Now we're not doing a fluid mount scan today. I'm actually going to do a separate video just on how to wet mount scan using your Epson. Today we're doing uh, what I would call quick and dirty scans. Um, the wet mount scanning yields better results, but it is very uh, time consuming and it's, uh, it's a lot of work. So when you get a new roll of film back, you got to get that baby out, man. You got to post it on your Insta books and your Facegrams right away. So we can't be doing a fluid mount on every single, uh, every single scan. So we're looking at uh, dry scanning today. It's going to yield excellent results. It's just not quite as good as a, as a wet mount scan. Now these scans are going to be plenty big for uh, posting to your website, sharing on social media, and you'll even be able to print from them. You just can't print huge. You know, if you're going to do a six foot wide piece, you want to do a wet mount scan or get a drum scan made. But these will be good for, you know, medium to small size prints. Um, by the way, uh, you like my light table cover? I have a matching Epson cover. Both are made by uh, Stone Photo Gear. He's a great guy who does great work, makes all sorts of uh, cool pouches and things for us film shooters. So uh, if you want to get yourself a nice Epson dust cover, check out Stone Photo Gear. Mine fits like a glove. We're still doing Ace Ventura, right? Now we will be using the film trays that come with your Epson. And it seems like people rag on these, but I think it's just because they haven't unleashed their full potential. There's something about these trays that is very, very, very important to know in order to get the best quality scan. And it seems like nobody knows about it. So let's take a look at the back side of the tray here. You'll notice on each one of these trays, there's these, these little feet on the back side. And they're all point, they all have an arrow on it and they're all pointing the same direction. Right now, mine are all pointing towards a zero mark. These little feet here, they actually pop out and you can either leave them out or put them back in the other direction. These feet are how you adjust the focus on your scan. Basically, when they're all pointed towards zero, this uh, tray is basically at the factory setting in terms of uh, scan height, uh, focus height. And that might not be exactly what you need because as great as these scanners are, there's minor differences between them when they manufacture them. They can't make them all perfect. So if you were to take all these feet out, turn them around and point them towards the plus, it will raise your scan just slightly to change the focus. If you were to take these feet and pull them all out and just leave them out, it will lower your scan just a little. So it's really important to get these things set right. And you just have to do it through trial and error. Try a scan at zero, try it at plus, try it with the, the feet out completely, so at a minus. See which one looks best. I know that on my scanner, um, I get the best results at plus. So as you'll see on this image here, um, minus is definitely soft. It's not perfectly in focus. Zero is pretty good, but plus is a little bit better. It's not a huge difference, but it's enough to make me want to put them all at plus, and I get better results than just leaving it at zero. So today I'm going to be scanning uh, a piece of 645 medium format color negative film. And I shot this image, or actually we're, we're going to scan two pictures here. Um, I shot these images in Maui using a uh, Fuji GA645ZI, which is a fun little um, medium format kind of point and shoot camera. That's what I like about it. It's like medium format point and shoot. Now when you load up the film in the tray here, be sure to put it face down. So in other words, you want the, the film brand written across the top, like mine says Kodak, you want that to be reversed. You want to be looking at the image from behind. So place it face down, butt it up to the edge of the tray so that the black border around the image is mostly covered. And then what I like to do actually is I've cut out these little pieces of black construction paper and I typically lay these over the, the border of the last frame, just like so. And I do that for a couple reasons. One, it gives it a little more rigidity. When I collapse it, the, the, front, the film will flatten out a little bit better on the end. But mainly, I like to cover up the boundary between frames, the, the clear portion, because you can actually get flare uh, from the scanner light kind of creeping around the image. 
and that will create a little bit of a glow around the edge sometimes. So in fact, if you're only scanning one photo, it's not a bad idea to take a piece of construction paper like this and cover everything except the image. You know, cover up the border, cover up the other photos, and then that way you're only seeing just the image you're planning on scanning, and that'll minimize any possibility of flare coming through. But if you're planning on scanning all four negatives or any portion thereof, I just like to cover the border on the last one. All right, now we're gonna blow, hit it with some air. Get the dust off. Uh, I prefer an air rocket, a hand-powered air rocket like this, um, because if you use compressed air, it is a lot more effective, but you might get little sprays coming out of it sometimes of the material, you know, the that stuff. You don't want that hitting your, uh, hitting your film. This baby's re ready to load up, so we're gonna drop it on the Epson. Power it up. Now the software I'm using to run my Epson is Silverfast 8. And this costs extra outside of buying the scanner. Uh, it doesn't come with the scanner. And I know it's, it's hard to pull the trigger on, you know, spending extra money on software when the scanner comes with some software. But I'm telling you, if you get Silverfast 8, it's gonna make the process so much quicker, so much easier, and you're gonna get much better results. You know, you don't want to spend all this money on film and lenses and cameras and going to the location and gas money and all this kind of stuff and then skimp at the very last minute. Get yourself a good piece of software to run your scanner. I can't recommend Silverfast uh, 8 highly enough. It has this great feature built into it called Negafix. Uh, it stands for Negative Fix. And Negafix, basically, you get to put in the film you're using. So I'm going to be putting in Kodak, Portra, 400, and then it will automatically figure out the proper way to reverse the colors, remove the color cast, the orange color cast on color negatives, and get me the right profile, the right color balance, everything. Uh, it works really well and it dramatically speeds up uh, editing time because you're not sitting in Photoshop fumbling around with the curves uh, adjustment trying to eliminate color casts and driving yourself nuts because you see a color cast one second then you don't see it the next second, but then you see it the second after that. Drive you insane trying to do it visually. This thing will do it all automatically for you, and it does a great job. All right, so I have Silverfast pulled up here. I'm gonna start with the pre-scan. Pre-scan will warm up the scanner and do a, a low-res scan so I can see what I'm, uh, I'm actually looking at here. All right, here it comes. Okay, so a few things we gotta get set up here. On the upper left, first off, you gotta choose transparency, not reflective, that's for if you're scanning Polaroids or documents, and not wide transparency. Wide transparency is for when you're scanning film directly on the scanner glass. I do not recommend scanning the film directly on the scanner glass for a few reasons. Number one is the, the film likely won't stay perfectly flat unless it's sheet film, um, so you'll end up with a warped image. But more important than that, um, if you put a dry negative just on the glass, the glass surface like that, you're likely to get something called Newton rings. And Newton rings occur when two glossy surfaces come together and they kind of stick. It creates these um, rainbow circles and kind of these concentric circles and swirls in your image from the two glossy surfaces coming together. If you're doing a fluid mount, that doesn't happen. But since we're dry mounting, we don't want to put it directly on a piece of glass like that. So we're going to choose transparency. We're doing a negative, of course, but if you're doing, uh, you know, Fuji Velvia or Fuji Provia or some sort of uh, um, transparency film, you would go to positive here instead of negative. Uh, Kodachrome, if you're doing Kodachromes. Uh, if you have old Kodachrome film you're trying to scan, evidently uh, you got to put it on, on its own setting. I don't know what that's about. I guess Kodachrome scans weird or something like that, so the software needs to know you're doing it. Under bit depth, I'm gonna choose 48 bit. That will give me a 16 bit TIFF file, which is exactly what I want. That'll give me more flexibility for editing the picture later on in Lightroom or Photoshop. Uh, I'm gonna choose TIFF as the file format. And the resolution here, this is an important one. So the resolution indicates, you know, how many pixels per inch it's gonna get from your negative. You can put this at anything you want, really, but uh, it all depends on how big you want the resulting file to be. Now, just for ease of numbers, 
let's say you have a negative that measures one inch by one inch. So if you're holding it in front of you, it's one inch by one inch. And let's say you scan it at 2400 PPI, pixels per inch. You're gonna end up with a scan of 2400 pixels by 2400 pixels. If you put it at 4800 pixels per inch, it's gonna be a 4800 pixels by 4800 pixels uh, file. So it all depends on how big you want the image to be. I scan almost exclusively medium format and 6x17. So I have my PPI around 2400 and I find that's plenty big for uh, web use, blowing it up uh, for prints, you know, up to maybe 16x20. Um, plenty big for social media. So I do 2400 pixels per inch. On a 645 negative, like I'm about to scan, that's going to give me about 18 to 19 megapixels of image. If you're doing 35 millimeter film, you might want to bump up that PPI a little bit um, because it's a smaller negative and if you want a bigger file, you're going to have to bump up the PPI. I don't like to go much higher than 2400 because um, the files get huge, they're going to clog up my hard drive and the scan takes longer. I only go to higher PPIs when I'm scanning for a large print. But since these are our quick and dirty scans, I'm just going to do 2400 PPI and that'll be plenty big for almost all of my purposes. And then down below, we get to Negafix. And this is where we get to put in the type of film we're using. So I'm gonna put in from the vendor, Kodak. Look at all the brands they have here, it's awesome. So I'm gonna put in Kodak, film type. Again, look at all the different films they have. This thing's incredible. I'm gonna put in Portra, and this is 400 ISO, so I'm gonna put in 400. But look at all the different options here. I mean, it's like there's not really a film you wouldn't find here, um, unless it's a really obscure film. I'm going to uncheck CCR, I'm going to come back to that. But now when we do Negafix, there's a really important thing to pay attention to here. I was using Negafix for a long time and I was getting terrible results. It never seemed to give me consistent results, the color casts were funky, it's just like it wasn't doing what they claimed it did and I'm just like, eh, this thing's, you know, this thing's a gimmick, it doesn't actually work. And then I went to the Silverfast website and I read up on it. I actually read the instructions, imagine that. And Silverfast states, not clearly, but they do state this, make sure the frame is within the image area, not including any border. So in other words, if I'm gonna scan, uh, say image number two right here, I need to make sure that my scanning frame, this red box, does not overlap the border of the image at all. When I started scanning, I was always including the border. So I had my film uh, area basically bigger than the image area because why not, you know? I'll, I'll fine tune it later, I'll crop it later in Lightroom or Photoshop. I, I might as, I, no reason to get super nitpicky here, I'll do that later. Little did I know, that's why my results were so crappy. So you need to take this um, scanning area, this frame, and pull it within the border. Otherwise, Negafix gets kind of confused and it uh, doesn't do a good conversion. In fact, you'll see that when I snapped it in, instantly, colors look way better. So don't include the border. Now under Negafix, you can adjust exposure, of course, if you see fit. I would like this image just a little brighter, so I'm gonna bring it up. Don't go too bright or too dark on this, though. You don't wanna clip your blacks or your highlights in your scan if you can help it. You can always clip blacks and highlights later if you want to, but make sure your scan has all the details you need to work with. Tolerance, if you adjust this, this changes um, basically how the software detects the orange color, the orange masking in your negative. I'm a little unclear at what a higher number versus a lower number actually tells the software to do, but basically just drag it high and drag it low and see how it affects the picture, and then see if you can find something in between uh, that works well for it. Like you'll see if I drag it too high here, uh, the highlights kind of blow out and I'm losing detail there. And my histogram is clipping on the lower left uh, or just below the Negafix thing here. It's clipping on the highlights. If I go too low, the highlights are kind of dull. So I'm going to bring it up a bit until I feel like it's a good representation of what I'm, what I'm envisioning. So I think that's pretty good there. And then we have the CCR button. Uh, click CCR if you want to hear some sweet tune skis. Down on the corner, party in the street, Willie and the Barber, the Bay, Bay, the Kitty, Bay, the Kitty. 
Creedence Clearwater Revival. Come on. CCR? No? Nobody? All right. Now, CCR stands for Color Cast Removal. And if you click this on, uh, Silverfast is going to try to detect if there's any color cast in there that you might not want. You'll see here when I clicked it on, it realized there was too much of a bluish green tone. And it just got rid of it. Did a great job! So I don't really have to do any color correcting myself. It's really, really great. It saves a ton of time. Now CCR is a little bit of a dice roll sometimes. Uh, occasionally when you click it, it will eliminate a color cast that you actually wanted. So just use it on a case-by-case -case basis uh, when needed. Um, but I got my Negafix section all, uh, all worked out here. Below that we have picture settings. Uh, we, we can adjust mid-tones or saturation. I usually like to bring saturation up a little bit in the scan um, because I find my scans to be uh, pretty low in saturation. Uh, now this isn't Fuji Velvia, so I'm, I'm not going to crank the saturation, but I'm going to get it to what I feel is an accurate uh, representation of uh, Kodak Portra. Below that I have unsharp masking. I'm actually going to turn that off by clicking the X here. Uh, I'm going to sharpen the picture later in um, Photoshop. Now there's a ton of other tools here. Uh, you know, we have histogram, gradation, global CC, SRDX, all this stuff. I don't really use too many of them because uh, much of it can be done later in Lightroom and Photoshop where I feel a little, a little more comfortable with the controls. But like if you feel the picture needs a little bit of warming up or cooling down, I like global CC, global color correction. Just has this awesome color wheel where you can pull the dot towards warm or pull it towards cool or towards green or magenta. It's kind of a very easy visual way to adjust the color balance on your picture. Um, you can even isolate it down to just highlights by clicking 25, just mid-tones by clicking 50, just shadows by clicking 75. Um, so you can work on the color cast just on those sections if needed, or click the three bars to the left in order to affect the color cast on all the tones equally. So like this picture, I'm actually going to warm it up a bit. I'm just pulling the dot towards kind of a yellowish uh, orange color. You can also do a tone curve, gradation. By the way, any adjustment you make on a global color correction, global CC, is affecting the tone curve. That's really what it's doing. In fact, you'll see right here, if I adjust my uh, global color correction, you'll actually see the tone curve is, is going all over the place. So they're the same tool, they're just visualized differently. I tend to find the global CC a little more intuitive. And then one other tool I am going to use here is ISRD. That's scratch and dust removal, and the I stands for infrared. The Epsons have a really cool feature where they can, um, they can scan at an infrared wavelength, and that can be used to basically eliminate dust from your picture. It's a really awesome technology, but if you turn on ISRD, what will happen is when you make your scan, it's going to make two passes. The first pass is the regular scan, and then it does a second pass, but using the infrared uh, wavelength of light. And using that infrared wavelength, it can actually kind of detect dust separate from the image, dust and scratches. And it can kind of make a map of all the dust on your picture and then subtract it from your picture. It's really awesome. It has really uh, increased uh, or sped up my uh, post-production time because I'm not spending nearly as much time cleaning up dust. It takes care of uh, dusty images uh, pretty damn well. So I recommend using ISRD. It increases the scanning time a little bit, but it's not terrible. So I got this scan pretty much ready to go. It's looking great. I don't think I'm going to need to do much to it once I get it in Lightroom or Photoshop. Uh, but I actually want to scan the image right next to it. So with my frame selected, I'm going to press Command D, or if you're on a PC, Control D. That will duplicate the frame so that you can drag it over. And since it's the same film, it should be pretty much the same adjustments. But again, I want to make sure my frame is not overlapping into the border at all. Otherwise, Negafix is going to get confused. Now this image looks a little too warm to me. That's because of the global CC I used on the previous image. Got copied over, but I'm going to reset the global CC. There we go, it's a little cooler. Might even pull it a little more blue. Cool, that's looking good. All right, so these two are ready to go, and I'm gonna batch scan it. Um, normally what I do is if I bring up, say, two strips of film, so I have eight images pulled up, I'll put, the bot, I'll put a frame over each one of them, all eight, and then I'll batch scan them. It'll run for me, and I can go, uh, you know, relax while this thing's going. 
So I'm going to go up to scan. I'm going to click and hold so I can go to batch scan. I'm just going to send these to the desktop because we're just doing kind of a trial run here. I'm going to create a folder. I'm just going to call it Maui for these scans. You go into that folder and I'm going to title these uh, Maui Beach Views. And then I want it to add a 0, 01, 0, 02, 0, 03, whatever at the end, separated by a space. Then we click scan and it starts. Scanning process can sometimes take quite a while, especially if you're at a really high PPI and um, it's a large negative. But you know, that's the way it goes. So pour yourself a cup of joe, sit back, relax, let the scanner do the work for you. Oh. Oh. All right, first one's done. Let's take a look at it. All right, now I'm gonna eventually bring this into Lightroom. I prefer doing my edits in Lightroom because A, it has excellent file management so I can find my, my negatives easier. But also I like the non-destructive editing aspect of it. I don't have to worry about ever messing up my original raw um, scan. But I am gonna bring it into Photoshop first for one reason and one reason only, which is to sharpen it. I recently discovered uh, Smart Sharpen in Photoshop. And I know I'm a Johnny come lately to this, but uh, if you go to filter, sharpen, smart sharpen, it's incredible to me how well it sharpens the picture. Um, really improves the quality of your scan. So filter, smart sharpen, and uh, I'm gonna bring the amount up to, I don't know, maybe 150 or so. Do it on a case by case basis. If your picture has a lot more details to it, you can probably bring the amount up higher. But if it's a lot of smooth areas, Maybe don't go so high, it'll start to sharpen the grain. The radius, bring that up high if it's a large file. Don't go too high if it's a smaller file. And there's a kind of a telltale sign that the radius is too high. If you bring the radius too high, you'll start to notice halos around things, around edges. So you'll see if we look at like these palm trees here, they have these glowing edges. That's the radius being too high. Um, so I'm going to bring the radius down until those go away. But I don't want to go so low that the uh, sharpening isn't really doing anything. So I'm going to bring the radius up until I see a little bit of haloing, like right there, and then I'm going to back it off until that goes away. Good. All right, so Smart Sharpen is really, really effective. I'll show you. I'm going to look up at the palm tree fronds here. Um, there's with it off. There's on. So off. On. Let's go to another part here. There's off, on, off, on. You'll see the, all the sand and the plants and the water here. Off, on, off, on. Just really brings out the intricate details. Um, pretty impressive. So I'm going to do OK to apply it. Click Save. Close it. Then I'm going to do the same to the second file, pull it into Photoshop, and I'm going to go up to Filter, Sharpen, Smart Sharpen. Oh man, that's working wonders. Let's look at these buildings back here. Yeah, it's crazy. There's without, there's with, without, and with. The rocks too. Everything's way sharper. So apply my Smart Sharpen, save it, close it. Now I'm going to bring them into Lightroom. Okay, there we go. We're going to go to that folder. Okay, so I'm going to go over to develop here. I don't need to do much to this picture because um, the, the Negafix did most of the work for me. They look pretty great. Uh, but I think on this one, I'm just going to, um, to move the black point a little bit. I'm going to uh, deepen up the blacks slightly. And I'm also going to push the highlights just a little higher. So I'm going to basically add some contrast. That's really what I'm doing here. So I'm going to reduce the blacks and then push the whites up. So here's before and after before and after, very minor. I'm also gonna try pushing the highlights up so that all these layers back here are a little brighter. Before, after. 
Uh, I do want to increase the colors a little bit. I feel like it should be a little more colorful. I'm going to boost vibrance first and then saturation. The difference between those two, by the way, uh, vibrance, A, will leave skin tones alone. So if you're doing portraits, much better, to much better to boost vibrance than saturation. Saturation will make skin tones look yellow and uh, pinkish or whatever. Uh, but vibrance is also smarter than saturation in that it kind of identifies the weaker colors and affects those more. So if it identifies that the blues and greens are weakest, it's going to push those harder. Uh, where if it identifies maybe the yellows are weakest, it's going to push those a little harder. Um, it does affect blues and greens most, though, simply because it's trying to leave skin tones alone, which are in the uh, yellow-red color spectrum. So I'm going to boost Vibrance first to kind of bring up the weaker colors, and then Saturation on top of that to push them all up. Um, so again, here's before and after. So very minor change, you know, I'd really just boosted the contrast a bit, boosted the color a little bit. Now I just want to show you, I'm going to zoom in. Notice anything missing? There's no dust, baby. That ISRD works so well. Uh, my negatives always have dust on them. Uh, and I'm a clean guy, but uh, you just can't avoid dust on a negative. Um, so I highly recommend using ISRD on your color, uh, color film. Unfortunately, ISRD doesn't work on black and white film. In fact, if you try and select it, on a black and white film, I believe it'll tell you, hey, you can't do the infrared. It doesn't go through black and white film like it does color. So unfortunately, not so much on black and white film, but on color film really reduces how much uh, dust cleanup you're gonna have to do later. But this image is looking pretty good. Um, let me push the blacks just a little lower. There we go, I'm liking that. Uh, now, of course, if I wanna adjust the temperature and tint, I would do that under white balance, but I think it's looking pretty good. I'm going to copy these settings to the next picture because uh, they are the same film in the same location. I got to rotate this. Command bracket, bracket left or bracket right, or control bracket will rotate. Now I'm going to paste. There we go. Looking good. This one I might make a little bluer. I'm just going to take the temperature and drop it down. All right. There you go. Two scans. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Now I've been calling these quick and dirty scans simply because we're not doing the whole wet mounting thing. But uh, really they're just quick. They're not dirty, baby. These things are clean. They're good looking scans. They're sharp. Um, so don't be afraid to use those scanner trays and do some dry scans. It's just if you're going to print up a wall mural, get a better quality scan. Do some wet mounting or uh, something like that. All right. Thanks for watching. Have fun scanning out there, kids. Be safe. See you next time.